Welcome to Quick Bites, sponsored by H&A in Action, an initiative of the College of Humanities and the Arts at San Jose State University. We're excited to bring you this forum for urgent news where SJSU faculty members discuss current events and provide expert insights into the news that everyone's talking about. On behalf of myself, Catherine D. Harris, and Shannon Miller, Dean of the College of Humanities and the Arts, we welcome you to listen in on today's conversation between Etienne Brown and Matt Cabot about social media's growing power, the fate and limits of freedom of expression, and the reasons why the Musk takeover of Twitter affects everyone. Remember, contrary to the rules of Vegas, what happens on Twitter sometimes doesn't stay on Twitter. Coming to you virtually, live streamed from the Hammer Theater Mercury Newsroom, we invite you to post questions and conversations in the Vimeo chat by clicking the header from the sjsu.edu front page or submitting them through our Google form. Scan the QR code on your screen to submit your question. Welcome to our conversation. Hi, everyone. I'm Etienne Brown. I'm a professor in the philosophy department here at San Jose State. Uh, this is my friend and colleague, Matt Cabot, who is a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Matt, welcome to Quick Bites. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> so I wanted to dive right in. Uh, a lot of the people <clears throat> who are listening to us, watching us tonight, uh, have Twitter accounts. But probably a lot of people who are watching us or listening to us are not Twitter users or do not have Twitter accounts. Uh, we're here because Elon Musk, the infamous billionaire behind SpaceX and Tesla, is now the owner of uh, Twitter. Let us say you don't have a Twitter account. You've just learned that Elon Musk is now the owner uh, of Twitter. Why should you care? Well, you certainly know that this is going on because it's in the news like every single night, every single day. There's something in the papers and in the, in the uh, broadcast news. Um, there are more than 300 million people that use Twitter. So if you're not a user, chances are your neighbor is a user. And Twitter is the place where people go to get information about all sorts of stuff. It, it shapes public discourse in, in many different ways. I would say better for worse, but probably worse, because the way that it's built, it's like it's this, this really short form, these sound bites and these uh, headlines, makes it kind of a difficult place to have these larger conversations. But they do have these conversations. And we tease this in the intro, what uh, happens on Twitter may not stay on Twitter. We have examples of like the January 6th attack on Capitol Hill. And most recently, uh, you know, uh, Musk himself tweeting about his former uh, trust and security guy, uh, Yoel Roth, um, making some allegations that actually have caused Roth to be, um, to be uh, attacked or threatened uh, offline at his house. Yeah, yeah, I think you've touched up on so many important points already. So uh, first of all, we often speak of the digital public sphere. Yeah. Um, and you know, as opposed to the traditional or analog public sphere, physical public sphere, uh, I, I tend to conceive uh, of Twitter as a, actually a, a series of interconnected um, mm -hmm town squares, basically, right? There's different communities, um, and I think that those town squares or those communities are very much connected uh, to offline communities, or mm -hmm. the people who interact on them obviously also interact offline. And I think you're absolutely right um, that the kind of ideas that spread on Twitter are going to make its way to the society, so mm -hmm. uh, into society more generally. So we, if you don't have a Twitter uh, account, you're still going to be interacting with people who have been influenced by those ideas. You might right. end up being influenced by those ideas yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of questions that we've uh, want to discuss tonight, but you said something else that I can't yeah. resist kind of jumping on. Yeah. You said, uh, you know, if we think about the affordances of Twitter, mm -hmm. it encourages um, short tweets. Um, do you think that this form of discourse is actually beneficial overall for a democracy or for a society? Um, generally, um, a kind of form which is very different from the kind of thing that we're doing right now, right? Mm -hmm, Just taking mm -hmm. the time to develop our thoughts. Um, if we only had a certain amount of characters, um, maybe our conversation would look very differently. Is this overall good um, for society in, in your own view? Well, let, let's talk about the characters for a second, because one of the things that Musk wants to do is, is lengthen the characters from 280 to 4,000. I think he knows that the short form stuff is, it's not, it's not ideal for, for complex subjects. So what happens then 
is that we boil things down to maybe totally oversimplified. And, and we oversimplify, we also start to on social media and Twitter especially, uh, because of that, of that sim oversimplification, we tend to go to our polls. So the left goes harder to the left, the right goes harder to the, to the right, and what happens then is that we start to demonize the other side. In a conversation, it'd be totally different. Your neighbor uh, who is right or left, and you're the opposite of that, if you have a conversation like this, it's a very different conversation because it is a conversation. A lot of times, I think, on Twitter, people are, are uh, they're what's called quote tweeting, like they take something out of context, they put it on there, and it doesn't foster a more robust, in-depth conversation. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. I think that no. just, you know, being here discussing with you, uh, I'm kind of naturally inclined to kind of find point of agreements, um, thinking yeah. about what you say, things like that. And when I'm Twitter or I'm social media or mainstream social media generally, I'm much less inclined to do that. Like, I right. don't feel it personally. This is a personal, a, a personal um, uh, testimony, but I'm much less inclined to try to find a point of agreement with right. my interlocutor um, yeah. than, than, than I am here. Um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit also about um, what happened to Twitter um, since kind of Musk um, took over uh, mm -hmm. because not everyone might have been following uh, the right. news cycle as, as closely as we have. Um, so I'll let you react to, to this, but I think mm -hmm. that there's at least three things that we should mention, right? Um, that pretty important things that happened um, at Twitter since Musk took over. First, there were massive layoffs. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to layoffs, a lot of people have decided to uh, leave the company. That includes uh, a lot of people who held positions of leadership. You've mentioned UL Roth. Mm -hmm. um, a second thing that has happened that's pretty important um, for Twitter's finances is that a lot of major advertisers have decided to pause spending. I don't have uh, the perfect, the, the, the entire list in uh, my head, but it includes uh, key companies or major companies like Pfizer, right. uh, Audi. Um, so I think that um, it's very important to, to think about that when we think about Twitter's future, considering that last year, 89% of Twitter's revenue was mm. advertisers. Right. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty right now to know if Twitter, if, if Musk is going to be able to pull it off, basically. Is he going to uh, keep the company financially viable? And um, a last thing that I think or I want to, to bring up, and um, I'm interested in knowing what you think about that, mm. Is that we ha we we heard or we I've read that um, there has been a rise in hate speech um, on uh, Twitter uh, since Musk took over. It's not especially uh, surprising, considering that a lot of the people that have been fired were content moderators or mm -hmm. people who are technology policists, right? The people who whose day to day business is to write policies that are going to be applied to decide what kind of speech. Um, stays on the platform, what kind of speech gets recommended to user, what kind of speech is not recommended to users. Um, and I also think that Musk himself has contributed um, to this rise in hate speech. I think that he himself has engaged um, in very objectionable tweet. Uh, he's um, made very mean comments, uh, dangerous comments, I'm inclined to say, uh, about former uh, employees of, of Twitter. Um, so uh, that's something that worries me a lot, is to see this rise in hate speech in Twitter, the content moderators that have been, that have been fired, the technology policies that don't have the teams that they have, and then to, to have this chief twit, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this <laughs> yes. CEO of Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, indulging in that kind of right. incendiary speech. Uh, so what's your, what's your view on this? What do you think that this tells us for the future of Twitter? Yeah, it's kind of shocking, Etienne. I mean, the, he, he, the guy spent $44 billion in buying this company. And it's, it's one thing to trash a site if you don't own it, but now he owns it and he's still trashing the site. It's like, you know, you're holding a party, you want to be the cool guy, and he wants to be the cool guy at the party. But what if the party gets out of control? And that's what we're seeing, I think, right now with some of the, the, the hate speech uh, stuff. Um, I mean, I... It, it's hard to know where it goes from here. The, the big concern before he took over was content moderation. How would he do that? He decimated the teams that were doing it. So there was actual people who were doing content moderation. His goal, at least right now, is to do it through um, algorithms. And the question is, can he do it effectively with algorithms? What we know right now is that he, he bought the company for a lot of money. He either needs to uh, dramatically increase the revenues or reduce costs. And right now, 
he's reducing the, the costs. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, I think it's worth mentioning also that, you know, uh, this difficulty to moderate speech on the platform and the advertisers descending to pause their uh, advertising campaigns are related, right? What yeah, advertisers yeah. are worried about is precisely right. that Musk is not going to be able to moderate content right. as they want content to be moderated. Right. They don't want, a lot of advertisers are not interested in the kind of um, spe you know, free speech, free for all that Musk is, is, is interested in. Right. Which, which, go ahead, sorry. Well, no, and, and Musk, Musk can't afford to do that either because um, he needs to make money. And he said it, it cannot turn into a hellscape because at that point, it does not become commercially viable. And as you mentioned, 90% of its revenues come from, at this point, come from advertisers. I was going to follow up by, yeah. by uh, saying that I, I have a confession for you. Okay. I'm a philosopher who's very interested in mm. online speech and free yes. speech on social media and the philosophical implications of content moderation. Um, I'm not an Elon Musk expert, right? Um, I could not write an Elon Musk biography, uh, so I'm going to ask you this question. Oh, no, I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> what do you think is Musk's vision for Twitter generally? Okay, so, well, I mean, his goal, of course, is to, is to make uh, this common digital town square, right, where uh, a wide range of beliefs can be debated in a healthy manner. Beyond that, he has a host of things he wants to try to do. And one of them I mentioned before is that this idea of, of changing the, the 280 characters to 4,000 characters. He wants to lengthen that out. He, he, there's talk about him bringing back short form video like Vine. Vine was big at one time and then it, it left maybe because of TikTok or YouTube. He wants to compete with that. He wants to do encrypted DMs like WhatsApp. You know, so the idea that that if you and I are having a conversation on, uh, on Twitter and, and with direct messaging, that it can only be seen by us and not by a third party that's uh, surveilling that. And finally, he wants to do like a user to user payments thing. Uh, I think his vision beyond making this a digital town square where we can debate matters of importance is to make this thing the everything app. Yeah, yeah. which, 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 is, is another confession. It's something that um, I really struggle to understand, right? I'm gonna, yeah. I'm, I wanna follow up because you're the PR expert. I'm not, I'm not the PR expert, but you know, okay. You, payments to user to user payments. Mm -hmm. We have that, mm -hmm. right? Vine, like why, why wanna bring back Vine on Twitter when TikTok is doing very well? Right, yeah. uh, until it we gets banned. We have, <laughs> until it gets banned. Maybe that's another quick bite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we, you know, TikTok is, is doing very well. Right. Uh, it's very unclear to me that the reason why people are on Twitter uh, is because they're interested in video format. Mm. And act, as we've discussed already, it acts more like a kind of networks of, of town squares of public sphere. Uh, you know, people who have a lot of influence in society, I'm thinking of people who hold office, politicians, mm. but also celebrities use Twitter to be heard. Um, why is Musk trying to do that, right? Why, why yeah. is that the business plan? Um, why try to recreate or emulate those kind of services that, mm -hmm. uh, from my you know philosopher's brain, seem to be working quite well uh, <laughs> on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis? Yeah. All right. So from a from a business standpoint, why would someone do this? Well, there's the the idea in business called attack the undefended hill, and you want to go after something where people are not. Uh, do, uh, you know, you don't, there's no barrier of, of entry. Obviously, with something like TikTok, you think, well, they've got that locked down. But what, what I've read about this is that the content creators on TikTok and YouTube do not get paid very much. So his whole idea is you come to our site, you create content on Twitter, short form video, the Vine stuff again, and we're going to pay you more. And that might be the thing that, to, to get them in. I mean, part of it is, is ego right? He wants to have that the app X, the thing that everyone goes to where all of you, it's, it's one stop shopping. So instead of going to this store, this store, this store, you go to one place and you buy all your stuff at one point at, at one place. But my question for you yeah. is like, what are the obstacles for him to create this kind of vision for, for Twitter? Yeah, so, you know, what, what, I, what I'm most interested in from a kind of philosophical, philosophical angle is what you've mentioned and what we've discussed already. So Musk has this kind of, that's what he said, mm. at least, he has this vision of a Twitter 
that is a defender of free speech. Uh, he's tweeted repeatedly that the only content that you want to remove from the platform is illegal content, which means that every content um, that doesn't fall short of the law should, would, would stay mm -hmm. uh, on Twitter. And I think it's fair to say that if you're interested in content moderation, a lot of platforms have much more stringent content moderation policies. So there's this free speech vision that Musk has. Um, I think that we've already touched upon um, items of discussion that shows that um, it's going to be hard for Musk uh, to push this vision uh, because there's a lot of stakeholders mm -hmm. um, that don't <clears throat> agree with this vision. So I think one obvious obstacle is going to be advertisers' preferences, right? Unless Musk surprisingly manages to turn Twitter <laughs> into uh, a company that doesn't uh, get most of its revenue from advertising. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure he's going to succeed doing that. Mm -hmm. and, and those advertisers might say, uh, we don't want any kind of free speech, um, you know, free speech, free for all. We do want some free speech, obviously, right. but there are limits to that. We're going to get mm -hmm. into, into this, this question about free speech soon. It's something that I, I want to discuss with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think advertisers have a lot of sway. Uh, and we've seen also that, um, you know, there's Musk the businessman. Uh, and, and Musk the ideologue, right? So mm -hmm. there's Musk the ideologue who tweets about free speech, and then there's Musk the, the businessman that really, really is trying to kind of reassure advertisers. Right. One of its uh, first tweet uh, when he became chief to it was to post uh, a snapshot of a longer text in which mm. uh, that was basically a letter to advertisers in which he explained, don't right. worry. This is not right, going right. to be a free speech, yeah. uh, free for all. You can, you don't have to pause your advertising here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that um, advertisers are, are a major stakeholder uh, who who are going to have a lot of say. There's regulation. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the biggest push for governmental regulation right now is coming from Europe and the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, so the code of practice. Uh, uh, the European code of, new code of practice on this information is currently being implemented. Uh, the, the Digital Service, Service Act, Act yeah, uh, yeah. is going to be uh, implemented. And I think that uh, European officials uh, and UK officials are much less reluctant um, to publicly explain uh, to Musk mm -hmm. uh, and, and to publicly say for everyone to say that they will not tolerate uh, a kind of Twitter um, where there's very little content moderation, and then the risk, of course, is that Musk would le lose access to European markets, which right. are very lucrative, and again, it would be a major financial loss. Um, so there's, there's some uh, regulation that I think we're, we're likely to see, um, and then um, a, an under-discussed, uh, and I think like we have to credit Ewell Roth for drawing the public's attention to this in a very interesting op-ed published mm -hmm. in the New York Times, um, there's actually other tech companies that have a lot uh, of influence over what kind of content mm. is allowed, recommended, <clears throat> emoted, amplified on Twitter. And those other tech companies are Apple and Google. Mm -hmm. Why, you ask? Because App and Google operate app stores, right? Yes. The app stores and the Google store. And one thing that's not d discussed enough, I think, when we think about content moderation is that every app that wants to be on the app store on the Google app store mm -hmm has to comply with content moderation guidelines that, I, that are defined by Apple and Google, right? Uh, so we, we exist in a kind of tech ecosystem where two uh, gigantic companies mm -hmm. have an enormous amount um, of power to decide what kind of content users are going to be exposed uh, to on a wide range of applications. Mm -hmm. And of course, the business motive um, for these applications is that it's very hard to create an app um, mm -hmm. and then to be successful without having this app hosted on the Google App Store, on right. um, the Apple App Store. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of doubt in Silicon Valley uh, that Twitter could actually survive mm -hmm. if it was not hosted um, on the Apple App Store and the Google App Store. So it might be possible that it, it's possible. it might be possible yeah. <laughs> that uh, that the CEO or the leadership of Apple mm -hmm. and Google are going to say um, that kind of vision for mm -hmm. free speech, free for all, free for all is is not going to fly with us. This is not something that you can do, mm -hmm. uh, Elon. Uh, I'm guessing they're on first name basis. Uh, <laughs> If you want, if you want yeah. to remain on their platform, so just advertisers, regulations, um, Apple um, and Google 
all of uh, these entities have an enormous amount of influence to decide, uh, an, an enormous amount of power to influence what's good, the, the future of Twitter is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna let you react, I'm, I'm getting chatty uh, about this question because I think that's um, an, an really important point to discuss. Um, I think that it's worth asking the question whether or not we do want to live in a society where two extremely influential companies uh, get to define content moderation guidelines that basically affects mm -hmm. <clears throat> all other apps, right? That's an enormous concentration of power. Um, again, it's something we can touch upon, touch upon. I tend to think that social media's company actually govern, right? Mm -hmm. they, they govern speech online. They decide what is allowed, what is removed, what is amplified, mm -hmm, what is demoted, mm -hmm. that amounts to a form of governing power, which means that the people who are subject to that governing power should probably have a say mm -hmm. um, about, about those decisions. So yeah. I think those are the obstacles to Musk Vision. Do you yeah. see any other obstacles or do you have anything to add to this? Well, my, my, my thought is that what's bigger than Apple or Google? Elon's ego. <laughs> okay, so the thing is, is that <laughs> Uh, I mean, he already talked about this. Like, if he cannot do what he wants to do, if they put him on a short leash, uh, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll make the phones. I'll, I'll do this instead. Um, I, I don't think at this point Apple can afford to have Twitter be gone, right? And it's, they, they make a lot of money from, from Twitter, uh, the 30% tax, yeah. as, as uh, Elon talks about. I think it's a really good point to, th to think about this idea of the concentration of of power in two big companies to say what we see and what we don't see. And I think that's part of the, the appeal for Elon Musk is to say, we should have much more access to, to information. It shouldn't be two yeah. big companies saying, you can see this, you can't see this. Yeah. Algorithms are the same way. Yeah. All of a sudden we start to see the same things because they figured us out, right? They think, oh, you like that? Yeah. You're, you're looking at uh, golf? Okay, I'm gonna give you every golf thing you ever seen in your life, right? So, so this, I think part of the appeal for Musk is that he doesn't like that either. So that's, that's going to be his challenge, I think. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's, it's one thing to criticize Elon Musk's vision for the expression I've used repeatedly is free speech, free for all. Um, it's much harder to answer the more general philosophical questions of what exactly um, should be the limits of freedom of expression online. Mm. Um, it's uh, a question that I'm obsessed with, but it's not a question that um, I have a lot of ease uh, answering, although mm. I have a lot of things to say about it. Uh, but <clears throat> I want to ask you, yeah. uh, Matt, this big question to get your perspective on this. Um, what do you think are the limits, should be the limits of freedom of expression um, online, on social media, on mainstream social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, TikTok? Et cetera. It, 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 at the end, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think the first thing that we need to rid ourselves of is this notion of a free speech utopia, right? Um, there's no way to create a meaningful free speech platform where genuine, actual debate happens without people being exposed to hurtful ideas or, or uh, painful speech. Um, and since Twitter is a private company, it can and it has set its own rules for what they want to do. But if Musk wants a platform that is, that's going to be um, accessible for all users, then I think he should abide by First Amendment rules, right? That's, that's, we've got a constitution that can lay this whole thing, this thing out. And the principle number one in, in, in the First Amendment is uh, viewpoint neutrality. Every single person who's on Twitter should have the same rules. Yeah. It should apply to Democrats. It should apply to Republicans. It should apply to liberals. It should reply, uh, uh, apply to uh, conservatives. Um, and the second thing is, is that um, when we talk about moderating content or, or free speech, there are traditional free speech limits, right? Viewpoint neutrality is not a synonym for unmoderated. Right, we, we, th th this consistent with viewpoint neutrality is a platform can impose restrictions on what happens. Think about the, the restrictions that we have already on offline speech. Yeah. Uh, defamation, 
Yeah. That's, that's not protected speech. Yeah. Harassment is not pr protected speech. Yeah. Invasion of privacy yeah. is not protected. So the idea of doxing would be something that they should um, uh, sanction. But the other thing about it too is that the other sort of core principle of this is clarity, right? Uh, it, it needs to be clear and it, and it needs to be transparent so everyone knows what the, the, the rules are. Yeah. And I, I think that um, this is gonna be super important if we wanna go forward and have a, a site that's there for everyone. Yeah. And the last thing I'm gonna say is about um, what we don't wanna do. We don't wanna use censorship. Censorship to me is divisive and it's ineffective. You think about what well, we just heard the, the whole Twitter files came out and talked about how um, Twitter, they, they, um, they deep demoted or, or, or made it almost impossible to, to share the New York Post article about Hunter Biden's laptop. What happened after that? Searches for Hunter Biden's laptop skyrocketed yeah. on, on the internet. And in fact, there, this, this, uh, this fact of um, the opposite effect is so well known in internet circles that there's a name for it. It's called the Streisand effect. And what happened in 2003 is that Barbara Streisand uh, sued an internet site uh, to take down an image of her home that was on the, on the site. At that time, the image of her site was, of her home, was downloaded six times, twice by her lawyers. As soon as that lawsuit hit the news, the image was downloaded 420,000 times in a single month. Okay, so I don't think it's censorship. I think that, that it's got to be content moderation, and we've got a lot of good rules using the First Amendment that will help us do that. Let me, so let me uh, uh, push you or push us a little sure. bit on this, because I think that, uh, you know, I might have a slightly different conception uh, of free speech than you have, which doesn't surprise me also because uh, I didn't grow up in this country. So mm. uh, for me, it's not just about the, the First Amendment. I mean, if we, like, pragmatically, let's, let's start with this. I think I can say with confidence that if you look at the content moderation guidelines that exist on mainstream social media, um, it's been a while since I've looked at, at uh, Twitter's precise one, but mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that a lot of speech that is in extreme cases are removed from the platform, a lot of users that are banned, but there's also a lot of other kind of content moderation that you can engage in, right? You can decide not to recommend content. So basically content on the platform is gonna be searchable, but it's mm -hmm. not gonna be recommended to users. Mm -hmm. um, you can demonetize content, make sure. it sure that, you know, uh, maybe you can post it on platform, but you can't boost it, right? Using mm -hmm. uh, the paid feature where you pay some money to ensure that you're gonna reach an audience. Right. I think that um, the, ca the categories of speech that are demoted one way or another on mainstream social media are much wider than the categories of speech that are not protected mm -hmm. uh, by, by the First Amendment. And the controversial thing that I'm inclined to say, I'm gonna put my philosopher's hat, mm -hmm. is that a lot of this content um, is harmful and mm -hmm. should actually be mm -hmm. removed um, and, and demoted. This is the kind of work that trust and safety teams engage in mm -hmm. every day, which is why I'm extremely worried mm -hmm. that uh, the, the trust and safety team at Twitter has lost its head um, in your world, rot, but also a lot of people that were working uh, under him. So I tend to think that um, there's a fairly simple principle. Uh, it's complicated to apply, mm -hmm. but it's <laughs> elegant in formulation. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually a lot of companies, social media companies, operate with this principle, which mm -hmm. is that basically the central category is harm. Mm -hmm. Risk of physical harm, but you can also operate with psychological harm and mm -hmm. things like that. And if a content is deemed harmful, it should be moderated in one way or another. And I'm going to say controversial because I say I agree with, with this principle. I mm -hmm. think that Things like hate speech, mm -hmm. um, even if hate <clears throat> speech is legal, and God knows that you know a lot of a lot of uh, hate speech is legal in this country, and mm -hmm. in other countries it, it wouldn't be. A lot of hate speech is going to be demoted in in um, in, content, in according to con contemporary or uh, frequent content moderation practices. I tend to think that it's a good thing, a good thing, and I want to know if you agree with that. But before mm -hmm. I let you react, I want to say yeah. that there's definitely one thing that I absolutely agree with with you mm -hmm. is that we need more um, 
accountability on social media. So I think that um, actually, if you look at the regulations that are being pushed in Europe right now with the DSA mm -hmm. and the code on disinformation, um, they definitely go in the direction of accountability. So it should be the case, I think, uh, that content that is demoted one way or another, uh, I think that users should be notified um, that it is the case. Um, and um, I also think, or also, I so dream um, uh, of a future, although it's more, it's more speculative to say things like that, mm -hmm. um, where users have more of an influence um, on um, how those decisions are made. That doesn't necessarily mean relying on Congress and regulatory bodies. That can be one way of doing that. Uh, but th there could be kind of internal democratic processes that are put in place by those, those companies. Mm. Um, but I do think that transparency and accountability are, are, are important. I mean, if I want to be coherent what I said before, I do think that social media platforms exerts, uh, exercise a kind of governing power. Mm -hmm. And that means that peoples are subject to this power. And if they want to be more than subjects, but they want to be something like denizens of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the digital public sphere, then they need to exercise some sort of uh, check and balance power mm -hmm. um, on, on those companies. So basically, my follow-ups for you of, um, do you agree with my vague criteria of harm, which is, of course, extremely difficult to apply mm -hmm. because deciding if that piece of content is harmful is a very hard job. And like, uh, I gotta salute the people working in trust and safety team that, that do that every day. Do you agree with that, that if it's harmful, we should demote it? Um, and do you agree that um, eventually we should move towards a future where users of social media have some sort of control or at least say Mm -hmm. or at the very <clears> least <throat> more knowledge about the content, content moderation practices uh, to which they are kind of daily submitted or, or subject to. Yeah, I, so I, I, I do have a problem with the harm thing because it's so vague. To me, I would say that the devil's in the details on that. It's, it's, it reminds a little bit about, about university speech codes yeah. that have since kind of backed off a little bit because it is such a broad definition if you, if you think that the, the social media sites have power right now, yeah. if you have such a vague um, uh, criteria as harm, I think it gives the, the social media companies more power. Yeah. Because all of a sudden they can, they can determine, maybe even in, without much fanfare, that this was harmful. I mean, so what, what causes harm? If I say this is harmful, like if you were to say uh, to me, I think that the 49ers are awful. And I'd say, at the end, you've just harmed me. Because actually, I think that they're okay. I don't know, I mean, that's a ridiculous yeah. example. But, but you, you can see how the, that, the harm to me is too yeah. vague to, to, that, to, to, to put through. That's a long-standing yeah. uh, yeah. debate about the, the regulation of hate speech. I still think that you know uh, when hate speech attacks well, people I'm, that belongs. I'm, hate, I'm against hate speech, just yeah, for the record. Well, well, yeah. well when, I'm, yeah. when I'm thinking about speech that's psychological, psychologically harmful, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of things like uh, racist speech, yes. anti-LGBTQ plus uh, speech. Those, so um, basically yes. speech that affects uh, members of uh, minoritized populations. I think that there's two ways in, in, in which this speech is harmful. It can create an environment mm -hmm. in which it's more likely that acts of physical violence are going to be committed. And it itself, being re repeatedly exposed to this speech can have um, uh, harm on you. Um, I don't want to deny, I, I don't want to deny that it's hard, um, it, it's hard to apply d this criterion. Uh, I still think that it's, you know, maybe it's kind of a, it's a very difficult thing that we should keep doing. I'm more worried about stopping to do it um, mm -hmm. than uh, the complexities that, that come with applying this criteria. Uh, but, but um, and by the way, just for the record too, all those things you just said, all those hate speech things, yeah. are those, those are clearly defined incidences of harm that I would agree with you on. Yeah, yeah. And, and another thing that really mm -hmm. resonates with me that you said is that, um, you know, and maybe maybe discussing with technologists or people who work in, in, in tech policy could uh, help me change my mind. But I tend to think that mm. um, yeah, you said all the, all those content content moderation guidelines are going to end up giving more power to these companies. And I tend to think that there's actually a tension mm -hmm. between um, what I would call harm minimization um, and accountability. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it's unclear that if you decide to democratize content moderation decisions on mm -hmm. mainstream social media, 
that the decisions that would be taken by the majority of people would be the ones that minimize harm the most, right? This is why in a democracy we have expression like tyranny of the majority, right? right? And right, this idea right. that we have to protect minorities from right. um, the, the majority opinion. I very much believe that, right? Yeah. Like I'm enough of a liberal, a political liberal in the philosophical sense of the term that thinks mm. that people have a basic right to be protected from harm and that mm. um, protection of, of, of these rights can even sometimes trump majority decision, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is an idea right. that, that basic, that's why we have charters yes. of rights, right? We have a constitution right. in Canada, we have Canadian, yeah. we, have some, we have something similar. Um, but I don't know how this tension will be resolved, right? How mm. are we gonna make it so that the people who are uh, subject to kind of content moderation decisions without having any say are gonna have more say, but at the same time, we're gonna be able to keep reducing harm. I think mm. it's one of the central challenge of social media um, within the next 10 years. I don't have a perfect answer to that. Okay. I'm guessing you also don't. But I think maybe <laughs> for tonight, just like bringing up this tension, right? So mm. that we can think and discuss it in the public sphere is, is already uh, an accomplishment. Yeah, that's what I, I wanted I to say about about freedom yeah. of expression. But maybe you have even more no, no. To say. I, I no. I think it's I think it's super important. But I'm also thinking from the of things that that, that Twitter could do to actually uh, make it better in terms of th things like you know maybe maybe there's a little check mark that you have to check to say I've actually read this yeah. before I before I retweet it. You know, create yeah. some friction. So there's stuff that goes on that we can actually. Or we can think about user experience. I don't know, again, I'm kind of uh, thinking out loud, but I think it's a possibility mm. that's, that's worth bringing up. We could think about social media where uh, you have more flexibility with deciding which content moderation applies to your own feed right. uh, um, and, and things like that. Um, I see the, the clock ticking. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I need to ask you then, sir, yes. what, is, what is the future of Twitter? Where do you see this going? What do we, what do we need to do from here? I mean, I, I honestly, I, I go back and forth on this question, right? Like so, some, some days I, I read the news about Twitter and I, I tell myself, um, I, I think that Twitter is here to stay. And the reason why I think that is that um, a lot of Twitter users are really not ready to lose uh, the, the platform, the, the communities that they've created on the platform. There's a charitable and an uncharitable <laughs> interpretation yeah. of that claim. Let mm. me start with an uncharitable, which <laughs> I think is the wrong one, okay. uh, right. but then there's the charitable one. The uncharitable one mm. is a lot of people have thousands of followers right. and they're used to the attention yeah. and they don't want to lose that. Right. So that's the, that's the uncharitable. Yeah. The, the charitable version of that claim is that there's good reasons why people don't want to lose their followers, right? Mm. People have found on Twitter things that they find very valuable. Mm -hmm. They've created communities. They've met people that they couldn't have met. Mm -hmm. um, they've found people that have a life experiences that are very similar to theirs. Um, and if suddenly they decide to move to a Twitter alternative like Mastodon, which is uh, another social media platform, they're gonna lose their, their followers and, and they're gonna lose the kind of precious things yeah. that they found on Twitter. So honestly, um, I think that we need in 2022 if it's not Twitter, we need something like Twitter. We need, we need a digital public sphere where people can form these communities. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, online town squares where we are exposed to what people who uh, hold a lot of power in society uh, think uh, and say. I think that um, in a way we need to know what people who hold office, for instance, are thinking and saying. Uh, so that we may we can make informed decisions about whether or not we want to vote for them, right? Yeah. So there's a democratic function that is mm. per, that is performed or accomplished not just by Twitter but by by mainstream social media. Uh, generally, there's all these communities that form and that are are very valuable. Um, I do think that. Uh, you know, we've discussed a lot uh, about freedom of expression tonight, and there's something else that I think we start to need, uh, we need to think about more as a society. Um, I think that what kind of public sphere, digital public sphere we want to, to have is also, um, also presupposes that we engage in, in a reflection on what we can, what I am inclined to call the distribution of attention in mm. the attention of economy, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we all have limited attention spans. Yes. Uh, right now, I think that uh, we are bombarded with targeted ads and things like that. We right. could create a, an alternative digital public sphere when we make sure that uh, different kind of actors or different diverse voices um, are allocated uh, a significant portion of 
what we can call the collective attention, right? Mm -hmm. um, I tend to think that that's quite a radical idea, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, might, it might mean starting to think about what kind of voices are not really heard on social media, and can we kind of design social medias that would make it so that those voices are more heard? Does mm -hmm. it mean that we should tune down uh, some of the voices that we always hear, mm -hmm. or things like that? So I think it's a radical thought, but I think that yeah. to think about justice um, in communication is something that we should um, definitely do. It's mm -hmm. a booming topic in political philosophy, and I'm very, very excited to see mm -hmm. the kind of work that my colleagues are going to produce on that. Excellent. When's, uh, your, app, when's your app coming out? When's my app yeah. coming? I am never going to create an app. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say, I'm when's your next article no, coming? No, no, I'm waiting for your app. Uh, I'm with you, man. I'll yeah. join it. Yeah. But let me, let me yeah. kind of reflect yeah. sure. back the question to you, and then I think after that it'll be time yeah. to move to the Q&A. Sure. Uh, but what do you think is the future of Twitter? Do you think we need it? Do you think Twitter is going anywhere? What, what, uh, what kind of Twitter do you... What, what's the, the nature of the Twitter of your dreams? Of my dreams? Yeah. Well, I mean, it would be great if we had a, had a Twitter where there was free speech under what we know. And again, I talked about the, the First Amendment, where there's actual debate, where there's, where there's with, without harm. I mean, uh, it, 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 again, I'm not a big censorship guy, but when stuff is said on Twitter and it does spill over to the real life and, and people are threatened, I mean, harassment, uh, violence, and invasion of privacy are all terrible things. If it continues down the path, like if it gets worse and worse, I think at some point people are going to go, it's just, you know, it is kind of a hellscape now. And I, wanted, I don't want to spend my time doom scrolling on this thing when I just see bad stuff after bad stuff. Yeah. I personally have not seen it. But I think, that, again, that's, it points to the, the, the really uh, the, um, subjective nature of Twitter. Your, your experience is going to be different. Yeah. Um, so, again, I would love to see... Free speech, but with guidelines. Yeah, we have guardrails, and if people are doing stuff where they shouldn't be doing, then they need to be kicked off. I mean, I'm thinking about again the the the, the analogy of of Musk throwing a party. Yeah, uh, he wants to be the cool guy. Yeah, but with if people start throwing furniture into the pool, is he going to kick those guys out of the party? Yeah, it's going to be a tough thing for him to to do. Uh, I right now I am cautiously optimistic. I think that. Um, it, 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 it may work, and it may be so, a place where it, it may be better than it was. Um, but I think, I think the jury's still out. We'll have to see. So I've, I've mentioned voices that we rarely hear and uh, voices like ours that we constantly hear since the beginning of the program. So maybe it's time to move to the <laughs> Q&A and actually a integrate bit. more yeah, perspectives think, think into the conversation. Yes, we should. So practice let's what we the, preach. Yeah, yes, let's practice right. what we preach. Okay, good. So that's a good segue because there's been a very robust conversation and series of questions coming from LinkedIn chatting. Oh. So we have quite a few, and I'm going to give you and combine some based on what you've been talking about. And it seems like we have a lot of technologists on the LinkedIn chat, so mm. we're getting a little bit different perspective, which is good for us, I think. So Marco on LinkedIn asks, how would you go about deciding what's bad and what's okay without being biased on there, on Twitter, but also from an interested Silicon Valley resident that's that gives you a little bit more insight into the technology, Musk seems to be proposing artificial intelligence as a functional content moderating process. Can that prevent Twitter from becoming a hellscape? Will it instead make it an overly saccharine space like Disneyland? <laughs> How would you address that? At the end, it sounds like your, your thing. So actually, yeah. yeah, like about the whole automated moderation thing, um, and then I both have to recognize like the, the limits of, of my expertise as a philosopher. There's a lot of people that are probably watching this feed that know a lot about this. I'm skeptical, and I've never read any convincing uh, argumentation that um, content moderation can be perfectly automated, right? I think there's always going to be borderline cases uh, where the model flags something as problematic or misses something that actually is problematic. Uh, I think that we should have human expertise <coughs> to at least review those decisions. And then sometimes the reviewers are going to be unable to make the call. They're going to escalate this to the policy team or another team. I don't actually know yeah. how different mainstream social media works. But um, I'm guessing that a lot of different teams uh, are usually involved when uh, there's very difficult decisions. And I think that 
um, in, in a way, it, <clears throat> it's a good thing. So I'm skeptical that AI is, is going to do the trick. There's going to be some AI involved. Right? There's some things that I think mm. um, you can easily automate. I think that, for instance, if you think about nudity and sexual content, um, that's probably where we would need to integrate a computer scientist in the conversation. But right. I'm guessing that then uh, models are going to be able to identify that. But when it's things like satire, uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, misinformation, right. or misinformation that's harmful, but it's harmful in a very subtle way because it includes dog whistles or things like that. It's actually attacking a subset of the population, but in a very, very kind of subtle and astute manner. I tend to think that the model is going to miss that. Call me naive. Maybe there's some techno optimist that, um, in, in uh, listening to us that, that mm -hmm. actually think that I'm vastly underestimating the power of, of, of AI. Um, but I think it's fair to say that it's also kind of how things are done right now, right? Mm -hmm. That um, there's, there's, if you, f for instance, if you uh, listen to what uh, leadership, the CEOs of, of mainstream social media are saying, they, they basically always say, we use a mix, right? We use right. a mix of AI um, and, um, and human, mo human moderators. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that if they're using human moderators, it's because they fulfill a function that the models can't, because right. it'd be much cheaper to just of fire course. them of <laughs> and, and rely yeah. on the AI. So yes. I think if they're, th if they're there, um, there's, there's pretty strong reason to believe that we, we need them. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, the, then the, the central question about how you decide what's good and bad without being biased. I don't think it's completely possible to not be biased. Uh, and, and I don't know, uh, I, I don't know if, if right now I have a better answer than build diverse <coughs> teams uh, that have discussion with one another and propose different kinds of policies. Um, and, and that's, that's a, a good way, uh, that's a good way of, of, of doing that. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of an easy answer, uh, but it's, it's an answer that I actually believe in. Well, so I'll, go, I'll go back, I'm, I'm, I'm can gonna, I go back to the, um, the, the core principle of the First Amendment, viewpoint yeah. neutrality. The yeah. same rules should apply to, to the, the people, whether you're liberal or conservative, I mean, it needs yeah. to be the same. It needs to be transparent. And yeah. if there's a violation of that, there needs to be a, a process or a means by which someone can be, can appeal yeah. there. And then without you know, having the debate that we already had, I'm, I'm going to say, yeah. I agree to the extent that harmful content can come from progressives, can come from, from conservatives. Um, if that's what you mean by viewpoint neutrality, uh, I, I'm on board. Okay. Uh, let's put it like that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my answer to the first question. Maybe we have, we have others. On, I don't want to censor you. <laughs> Judging me or her? <laughs> you. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm good. We do have, we have yeah. more, even more questions than we're going to be able to get to tonight. So I'm trying speedily to wrap them all together into these themes. Yeah. We have, the next one is from Alyssa on our Vimeo chat. She says, thanks for this. Etienne and, and Matt both, you've referred to Twitter as a town square multiple times. Mm. And it's been written about in the New York Times. Last week, Tressie McMillan Cotton argued on The Daily Show that Twitter is not a yeah. public square because it is a corporate owned space. Yeah. It's mm. a corporate public square truly possible. Yeah. That's the question. Is it truly possible? You take this one. Well, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And I, I think this actually brings up a larger question of whether, like, what's the role of Twitter in society? And Musk has this aggrandized idea that the future of civilization rests upon whether Twitter works or not. Um, the thing is about, about a, a town square. If yeah. you think about it, what it used to be. A yeah. town square was a town square where people knew each other, right? So there wasn't this sort of anonymous thing. I think the anonymity actually causes uh, some, some issues with that. Like you don't know the person, so you're much more likely to, to lash out or something. Um, it's a, I think it's a great question in the sense that there, there is a uh, governing body that is going to say what, what goes and what doesn't go. And you made the point that it could be two big corporations, Google and Apple, that are going to say what flies and what doesn't fly. So yeah. if, if, a, if a town square needs to be uh, completely ungoverned, yeah. then I guess a corporate town square is not going to work. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to say, j jumping, uh, reacting to this, uh, 
and I think it's a good it's a good question we have in the Q and A because I think there's important limits to to analogies like that. Although we're all uh, inclined to use them for good reasons, I think. Right? Uh, think about how does uh, contemporary social media compares to newspapers, town squares, broadcasters, and things like that. I'd say that for me, the, the best way to approach a question is to think about the function that uh, uh, a town square fulfills in the democracy. A town square is a place that's open to all, mm -hmm. um, where IDs, IDs are exchanged, right? Um, I do think that um, social media are something like that. They're mm -hmm. a digital version of a place that is open to all, to the, I mean, they, everyone can create an account where IDs are exchanged. It is privately owned, and town squares uh, are not. Honestly, um, I'm not sure that this is what we should focus on, um, that it's uh, either it's public or it's, it's privately owned. And the reason why I worry um, that if we, f the reason I worry about this idea that, well, it's not a town square, this discourse, it's not a town square, it's privately owned, is that I actually think that social media can use that to their advantage and say like then, say things like, it's not a town square. Uh, we're a private corporation, right? We're a private discussion club. So mm -hmm. you can't regulate us. If mm -hmm. you're unhappy, just go elsewhere. And I think we really, really need to push back against it. this kind of libertarian discourse mm -hmm. um, that <clears throat> exists. And I think Musk embodies this libertarian like ideology quite perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and, and that's what I was trying to get at earlier in the conversation. And I said, no, I, at one point, if you're regulating the flow of speech in society, it's not maybe not what you wanted to do. I don't think that's what Mark Zuckerberg wanted to do when, when uh, but, he but, created But who's created regulating Facebook. it, though? That's the key. Yeah, but, but just to finish, and then, yeah, and yeah. then I'll react. Yeah. Once you start regulating the flow of speech in society, the public and the government has a legitimate interest in regulating that, mm. right? Um, so, so I think that we, we have to see, it, to see it like that. It's a governing power that needs to be controlled. That, mm. That's a point that um, I, I'm quite attached to. How exactly it should be controlled, that's the hard question. And that's the one you just asked me. Is Congress gonna do the trick? I think it should keep trying, but the problem is that tech moves so fast that we kind of see Congress you know, running <clears throat> behind and having trouble catching with all, all the, the, the developments and, you know, uh, honestly, controversially, again, a lot of those kind of Senate hearings um, have been teetered, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we are doing something to kind of try to regulate tech. What exactly is changing? Um, I live a bit more optimistic about the, the kind of European and UK initiatives, uh, but I think it's, it's extremely hard to regulate tech. And I think that my, my final answer, and I'll let you react, is we do need laws, um, we, but we're gonna need more than this. And I think that the, the hard truth um, is that we're gonna need people working for these companies, mm -hmm. pushing very, very hard um, to regulate or make good <clears throat> content moderation policies because ultimately they are the one who are the best position to make the decision. And that's, that's a, a, a philosophical point that's important in debates about um, you know, moral duties and, and who, who should uh, fulfill them. If you are in the position to do good, mm -hmm. um, then that, gives you a very strong reason to try to do good, even if what's happening is not your responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, I think it is social media's responsibility. Um, so I think we're gonna need regulations from the government, but we're also gonna need a push from within those companies, um, and hopefully maybe <clears throat> more kind of internal democratic processes within those, those companies. So that's, that's the best I can try to offer tonight. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have specific views about governmental efforts to regulate tech. Well, all I would say as a, an academic who leans more libertarian, that's, that's a little bit, <laughs> yeah. the government control stuff, I just feel like it's a hard thing for them to do. I don't think they, they we don't want that kind of uh, control when they, you know, again, you went back to your other point about having a more democratized thing, the people, the users, yeah. be the, the, the denizens of their, of the information, right? I think push it down the lines of authority, the people that are actually using the, uh, the system. So I, I'm, I'm a little leery of government yeah. control. The, the ironic thing about this, it is the only thing that is bipartisan now in our government, is both yeah. sides are concerned yeah. that big tech is too big. To do probably very different things, yeah, but, yeah, but, but I agree with yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I have to admit, as we look at the chat in LinkedIn, we have a lot of fans of specifically Elon Musk. And I think what y'all are talking about tonight is Twitter 
and some of Elon Musk. So this final question for y'all tonight is can, from Gerhard on LinkedIn. Can, what can we learn from Elon Musk? And this same viewer asks, there's similarities between how the public has treated Galileo and Socrates and how the public is treating Elon Musk in 2022. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? Is that a comparable comparison between well, that? First reaction is Socrates asked a lot of questions. Uh, I think Elon Musk does more than asking questions <laughs> on, on Twitter. No, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, Again, I think Matt, Matt on this question is probably going to have better insights th th than <clears> me <throat> because you know he, he, he knows public relations w way more than I do. Uh, he clearly is a talented, intelligent, successful entrepreneur. So like, um, I think that we can learn, probably learn from him how to make uh, a startup successful. <clears throat> um, it's very hard for me to agree um, and, and it's maybe because I don't have this libertarian strand that, that resonates more with, with Matt, according to, to his own words. Um, it, it's very hard for me right now, um, when considering Elon Musk's ideological vision, to say nice things, right? Um, when you've tweeted things about former Twitter employees that led them uh, and exposed them to abuse, uh, I don't think that you should be commended for that. And, and I, I don't think that we should praise Musk just because he's a clever, intelligent, successful businessman. So we might learn very business strategies for him. Um, I don't think there's a lot of philosophical takeaways from, 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 from his vision. Um, if maybe I try to be charitable, um, I think that he feels the need for more platform democracy, uh, but the way he does it is probably not the best one, just by having these kind of polls on, on Twitter. But the charitable interpretation would be something like, he recognizes that there's a need for transparency and accountability, um, and this I agree with, right? That's me trying really hard. <laughs> <laughs> but again, well, the, the kind yeah. of abuse that exposes yeah. people on the platform right. is morally objectionable, and I think it is kind of our duty to, to publicly condemn that Sorry. yeah and I and I would I would publicly condemn that as well I mean that it's it's reprehensible and it, he's actually shooting himself in the foot what kind of a platform is he trying to create is it one where he can say things like that free form and actually cause real bad things to happen or is he trying to create a platform where people feel safe enough so free speech can actually happen yeah free speech does not happen if you feel like you're gonna be attacked Right. So if it's yeah. if it's unregulated Clearly. attacks, harassment, you know, violence and so forth, he's not going to create the site that he he can create. Um, I, I, I think uh, it, it, to, to say positive things about him, um, he has sent rockets that have worked pretty well. Uh, he has cars. No that, objection that, to that. Um, I know that people I've worked for both companies have said that he's kind of the mad genius. So occasionally we're getting mad. Occasionally we're getting genius. It's hard to know if he's the crazy guy or the, or the genius guy. Um, but what he might discover is that um, this space is more difficult to conquer than outer space. Yeah. yeah. And I'll think, I think we'll conclude on that really nice quick bite there <laughs> from Matt. Thank you for joining us for this exciting Quick Bites with Etienne Brown and Matt Cabot about this crisis moment in democracy in social media. Mm. If you didn't catch our entire conversation, please stay tuned for the video recording available soon on h and in Action. And join us for our next Quick Bites forum to discuss the world's news. We bid you good night. <laughs>